Good afternoon once again. The title of the sermon this afternoon is Capturing the Power of Authentic Vision and Belief. Capturing the Power of Authentic Vision and Belief ties in with uh, what the council is going to be talking about this next week. In fact, I have a handout for you again. It's entitled The Strategic Plan uh, at the top. And again, if you don't have a copy, um, everybody should have a copy of that because I will be uh, referring to and working off that particular outline. That was sent out this week by President um, Ms. President Vic Kubik and Robin Weber. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd tackle this particular topic because it is also a topic that I have been spending a lot of time on over the past year studying into particularly the topic of vision. And the Proverbs says in Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. There are different ways to translate that, and, you know, there's, um, we, we, I'm not, it's not my purpose to go into the nuances of what that exactly means, but when there is no vision, of a way forward, people perish, they do not get engaged, they don't get inspired to move forward. So it is a very important topic organizationally as a church and also as individuals. And I think, um, or I hope, as we look at this topic this afternoon, we will begin to see that vision is global and it is also local and touches us organizationally as well as individually, and that it then needs to be tied with belief in order for power to be unleashed. Conventional organizational uh, literature defines vision as a short, memorable statement that sums up the direction and focus of an organization in a manner that will direct the energies and resources of the company toward achieving a desirable future. And a lot has been said, and and, uh, um, and consultants have made a lot of money helping companies put together vision and mission statements if they lack one. And it's kind of become a a required part of organizational documentation. You know, vision statements, mission statements, and um, that is a good thing, but often, often it is simply an exercise in which people get together and say, well, let, let me think, let's see, we're, we're in business, uh, we have a club, we have a non-profit, there's got to be a vision here somehow, I mean, let's see, what would it be? And then, you know, if, if, if you lack inspiration then you hire a consultant that will charge you a lot of money to tell you what you should already know, and in the end, the vision statement gets put into an organizational document, and it might get hung on a wall, and that's the end of it. And then people perish. And the organization does not well. And churches are no different. The the wonderful thing, and we'll, uh, after we get through this introduction, um, we will get into it. The wonderful thing about the church is that our vision has been defined for us a long time ago, as has our mission. The question is really an issue then of belief. But just to, to, to frame the importance of vision, um, vision statements convey the organization's values and provide the guiding beliefs behind its mission and organizational framework. And as you'll see in your handout here, we've got a vision, mission statement, and then guiding principles. Um, so there, there's a there's a framework here that is common within organizations. But what I would like to uh, draw our attention to is what I have called authentic vision and belief as compared to, as compared to, you know, the kind of typical lame vision and mission statements that often get put forward in organizational documents. You know, authentic vision, I'm quoting here from a training document that we developed uh, over the past year in which we 
defined what I call authentic mission. Something that actually drives and has meaning and gets people to move. And we defined it in this way. And there are many different ways you could do it. And you'll, I think you'll see how this ties into what the vision statement is for the church, which was defined a long time ago. Quote, authentic vision emerges, emerges at that defining moment in time, usually born out of necessity, when Genesis and destiny meet to create a future reality that in actuality does not yet exist. It is a future reality that is burned into the hearts and minds of the individuals that put the vision forward that in reality does not yet exist. I want you to kind of think about that for a moment, and then we'll go to a few scriptures that bear that out. The vision that God set forward for his church and for you and I individually emerged a long time ago when God had a desire born out of love to bring many sons to glory. That vision emerged at the moment of its creation. Hence the term where Genesis beginnings and destiny meet. That's authentic. That moves people to action. It is not just some lame-brained idea that you put into some compulsory place in your documents. Continuing, oh, I have a, I have a personal example here that's, that maybe serves to illustrate the point. Perhaps it's a little bit silly. There's a, a memory that I have dating back to when I was five years old. And, you know, it's one, you know, you, you have a few early memories that are just kind of burned into your mind. We had a family friend who unfortunately passed away about two years ago who, who did me a tremendous honor. He, he wanted to come visit one more time. I hadn't seen him for years. He came and he was in a wheelchair and, um, uh, came to our facility and I gave him a tour. His name was John Demian. John Demian taught my dad the tool and die trade. He was from, uh, Elyria, Ohio. And he would come down on the weekends and he would, um, show my dad the tools of the trade and so forth. And then, there was a compulsory meeting, or and maybe that's, a, that's not the right word. Um, he would, we after we, the work got done, he'd come over to the house and mom would bake pie. And um, at one of those meetings, as we were eating pie, he pulled out a little bag of English walnuts and explained to me that he has a grove of walnut trees at his house and that if I were to plant these walnuts, trees would grow and walnuts would be born and of course um, I was not unfamiliar with what English walnuts could do when they were clad with chocolate on candy for the holidays, okay? I'm five years old, so I, I, you know, I had that clearly in mind. So, notice, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quoting myself here, but the fact that my husbandry of English walnuts as a five-year-old consisted only of a few walnuts in a planter gifted to me by John Demian, and, and I remember he told me now what you're going to have to do is to put these walnuts in a can of water and change it every day. And I forget now, I think we did that for two weeks or so because you had to soften it up, and then you planted it. So the fact that my husbandry of English walnuts as a five-year-old consisted of only a few walnuts in a planter gifted to me by family friend John Demian 
did not prevent me from envisioning at that early age a grove of walnut trees with abundant harvest that would enhance pies, cookies, and desserts for the holidays. Somehow, I just, you know, it, it, it all happened at that moment. And I saw trees. <laughs> the walnuts sprouted and the seedlings grew. Actually, only one of them ended up growing that first year. And that tree is still on my uh, sister's property and bears walnuts to this day. But the, di- the difference is, it was, I think I was 15 or 16 years old by the time this vision turned into a reality. But when I sat there at that table and received the walnuts as a five-year-old, the reality of that vision was authentic and it was there. The fact that I would have to wait for years in order to actually embrace it didn't even occur to me. That's a very different approach to vision than sitting down with a consultant and coming up with a paragraph that you put on a piece of paper. And the reason is, I as a five-year-old was engaged, and I don't know why the others didn't grow. I mean, I I don't know if I didn't change the water correctly or didn't plant it correctly. I mean, I don't know. One grew, the tree is still standing today. But it was a future vision that required me to do something immediately. Albeit a very simple task. Water and a walnut. That's authentic vision. You know, when I, uh, when my brother and I started the company that, um, I now own and manage, um, it was, I mean, looking back when you're 23 or 4 years old and you have more ambition than sense and no idea uh, about the difficulties ahead and how hard it would be and the sacrifices that would have to be made, um, it drove us forward. The, no- the notion that a better manufacturing company was needed and it was so compelling that the fact that we we lacked almost every tangible resource from money to machinery didn't deter us. Now let's take a look at your handout. And I would like to take a look at what I call God's authentic vision over in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. two. Two. In verse 10, this particular scripture encapsulates in one concise statement what God has been and is and will do with man for all time. And if you look at the words of scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, every single passage in some way connects to this authentic vision. For it was fitting for him, verse 10, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. The authentic vision of God is summarized by that statement. God decided long before the creation of the world that he wanted to have a family in the future of many sons and daughters and everything the Bible tells us and talks about in some way connects to that vision. Now, if you go over to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, and in Robin Weber's uh, letter to all the elders and members, dated 
December the 3rd, he quotes one of one of the Apostle Paul's insanely long sentences and paragraphs. But let's just take a look at that and notice how eloquently and how forcefully Paul articulates vision. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 3. Actually, I said insanely long. I say that in kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, because one of the things that we've just arrived at a point where we want to communicate or are forced to communicate in sound bites. You know, if a sentence is more than six words long, you know, you know, the, the shortest the sentence can be is about three words, you know, subject, verb, object. Um, and then you start building on that. Um, we, we have dumbed down things considerably. You notice how Paul was writing in his day. It kind of, um, makes you wonder whether we're, we really are as sophisticated as we sometimes think. But notice what he says here, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, comma. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I mean, that's a pretty long sentence already. But what we see here is that the authentic vision of God is something where Genesis met destiny. Because it says here that before the foundation of the world, God had already chosen us. Meaning, in that case, the New Testament church, and by extension, all of us. You know, when God decided to do this and create this vision of a family living on into eternity, he caught that vision. And it was born out of desire long before in the beginning and the uh, words of Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 were written. Continuing, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, comma. We're still not at the end of the first sentence. You see, not only did he choose us at that time to participate and become engaged in that vision, he had already thought through the process of how this would become possible. It was through an adoption process made possible, as we will read in a few minutes, by Jesus Christ. Continuing in the thought, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved period. You see, it took, if you look and you analyze the, the depth and breadth of what he said, it could not have been adequately articulated in sound bites. It is a grammatical construction in which one modifies the other and the vision is made possible through an adoption made possible through Jesus Christ for the purpose of, as it says here, for the praise and glory of his grace. Because, you know, when, when you see all the different things that are connected here, and this is why it is so important to look at the depth and breadth of Scripture and not just focus in on one thing to the exclusion of the others because... You can't capture the entire meeting. You see, it is made possible through an adoption process because of a great sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, which we'll read in the next sentence. Uh, Mr. Weber also quoted. 
And by doing all of that, it becomes possible for us to be the praise of the glory of his grace. It is a vision that required sacrifice to achieve. And then the engagement of those individuals that see the vision clearly in mind in order for it to get accomplished. And I can tell you from experience that no organization gets anywhere without those elements. Sacrifice, particularly early on, and the active engagement of many commitment people, committed people, is the only way forward. And the church is no different. Continuing in the next sentence, Mr. Weber quoted verses 1 through 10. In him we have redemption. Okay, so now he he starts the second paragraph in order to quantify the sacrifice that was necessary in order to achieve this vision. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, comma. You see, when we talk about the precious blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and what he did to make possible the adoption, I mean, it involves some pretty serious stuff. Continuing in verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself before the foundation of the world. He purposed in himself what would be and still is mysterious to many people that a universe-creating God would be willing to sacrifice himself for his undeserving creation in order to make it possible for the adoption of the adoption into eternal life. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, comma, now verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. And we're still not at the end of the sentence. You see, we are, as Paul was, in that dispensation of the fullness of time, and we still look forward to that. Time in which the vision that was engendered before the foundation of the world That was simply a compelling desire in the heart and mind of God and the Word. And in the fullness of time, this will finally become a reality. Verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Period. Two sentences written by Paul to the Ephesians in which he encapsulates the remarkable authentic vision that God the Father in Jesus Christ formed long before the world began, and we now are engaged in it. 
Let's look at Hebrews. Um, well, let's read now, first of all, the vision as articulated by the United Church of God. And you'll notice how this all fits in. A church led by God's Holy Spirit, joined and knit together by what every member supplies, with all doing their share and growing in love to fulfill God's great purpose for humanity to bring many children to glory. And then it quotes Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, and Ephesians chapter 4, which we are going to here in a moment. You see, without our active engagement, this visionary statement provided to us by Almighty God and for which great sacrifice has been made simply becomes another platitude that fills some compulsory space in organizational documents and is of no use. And that would be a monumental mistake if we were to do that. However, if we go back and we read what is written here, a church led by God's Holy Spirit, joined and knit together by what every member supplies with all doing their share, all doing their share, and growing in love to fulfill God's great purpose for humanity to bring many children to glory. Now, if you if you look at that and in the context of the scripture in Ephesians that we are about to read, and we actually act on it and work on it and become engaged in it, you've got something pretty powerful. It's just a question of whether or not we can make this an, a, a whole church effort in which, as we read here in Ephesians, everybody, the whole body, joined and knit together by, by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, if we lift that off the page and actually make it who we are and what we do, things begin to move. You know, maybe it's not such a bad thing that I don't have much more time to be a bad influence on all of you. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a part-time pastor, so there's a limit to the damage I can do. Because it enforces, it forces, rather, the engagement of many of you into things that you might not otherwise have done. And the in-home Bible studies, I think, is a good example of that. The last time we did them, 52 people were engaged in it in a direct way. And that's good. And I'm not scared of it either. Because if there is a problem, it is simply an opportunity for it to become manifest because it already existed. So we deal with the problem. Big deal. But it's a whole church effort, and everybody is able to supply. Notice in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4, And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. You see, making the vision a whole church effort does not take away from what we just read. It is Jesus Christ who gave some the function of apostle, prophets, evangelists, and teachers to engage people, to inspire them to do as it is said here, to prepare them for works of service. 
is the intent of the Greek. You know, if if we have apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers that are doing or performing their function for any other reason than equipping the saints for works of ministry for the edification of the body of Christ, then they're missing the whole point. And what is so human is we tend to always do one thing to the exclusion of another. A whole church effort means a whole church effort. From those that evangelize to those who engage in those essential acts of service that in the day of the judgment as described by Jesus Christ became the defining difference that determined whether or not Christ accepted them. You know, it wasn't the it wasn't an enumeration of the great and the grand. It was about water and food and friendship. Continuing, I mean that's works of service. Verse thirteen till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ. And I know I've mentioned this to you before, but when we were in uh, Jerusalem a couple of years ago at the Feast of Pentecost, um, a sermon was given in which the individual said, or the, the, the pastor said, I've been, I've been waiting for this opportunity when I've got all of you in the same room and all of us were pastors. And he made a point that really stuck with me. And he said, you know, when you go to a church area and you're there for a period of years, and as we have said in the pastoral ministry, until you're there until your shelf life wears out. It's a really complimentary turn. Um, once you've had that period, whatever it is, if people know more about you than they do of Jesus Christ, you have failed. You have failed. And then, I mean, I mean that was the sermon. <laughs> he wouldn't have had to say anything else. And that's what we, we see here, that the purpose is. The purpose is not for you to get to know John Miller and all his faults. You already know most of those. The purpose is that we all grow together in the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? That we should not no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. We'll always have winds of doctrine. And they come by trickery of men. In cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And then we have this phrase that's part of the vision. From whom? The whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body to the edification of itself in love. That's authentic vision. It is authentic because it has the backing of the creator of the universe. And that vision unleashes power if it is supplemented and applied by authentic belief. Let's go over to John chapter 7.
John chapter 7. <clears throat> Again, the topic of the sermon is capturing the power of authentic vision and belief. John chapter 7, verse 37 has under the title The Promise of the Holy Spirit something very important. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, if you have desire, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Verse 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. There is something so compelling, so powerful, about what I will, for lack of a better term, characterize as authentic belief, that it causes something to occur that is humanly impossible. You know, some people, people have asked me, John, how do you get everything done? The reality is I don't. It's an aberration, okay? Um, I come here. I believe this every day. That if I believe not in Jesus Christ, although I do that, if I believe in what he says... you are able to accomplish and to do things that are otherwise not possible. And it is, I mean, it's, uh, John so eloquently describes an impossibility here. The believer's heart, this is not, I mean, this is not Jesus Christ's heart that is being discussed here. Notice that the pronoun his is lowercase. The believer's heart it is out of that believer's heart that rivers of living waters will flow. And, you know, we don't have to guess what that is because it's defined in the very next verse. It's talking about the fruits and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, all of us know that it is impossible for rivers to flow out of a heart. Out of a heart. Rivers, plural. But if we actually believe the vision that Jesus Christ and God the Father that Jesus Christ and God the Father engendered, put together, and I can tell you that I didn't, they, I don't think they had angels with laptops consulting with them on what this vision would be. It was born out of love, of a desire to share that goes in direct opposition with everything we see in this world, which is a desire to, you know, gather and to bring and to compile and to take. They did that way back then. We just have to believe it. And when we do, a power is unleashed that makes things possible that seem impossible, like, you know, the church fulfilling its mission, which is the next um, statement here on the uh, handout that I gave you, and that is, it is the mission of the church to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God in all the world and make disciples in all nations and care for those disciples. I mean, that's about as audacious, well, I mean, it's more audacious as a 24-year-old Amishman naming a two-car garage operation Superb Design and Manufacturing Company. But I, I, I simply make that as a point. Vision drives things. An authentic belief into that vision makes it possible for you and I to do more than we are able. Jesus Christ said so. That's what makes it so. So with that in mind, well, let's go over to one more scripture in the book of John, and then we'll go look at these guiding principles, and I hope that 
in doing so, perhaps it all of a sudden makes the vision that we all have and know come alive and causes us to become more engaged. It's over to John chapter 15. This is another passage of scripture that that I have been um, looking at from an organizational standpoint and have found it to be very instructive. You know, organizations are organisms that have life and interaction. Well, they should have. There are many organizations that are dead and eventually they go bankrupt and uh, you know, when, when you're in business, that is, you, know, you, 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 you end up with financial bankruptcy and then you're dead. I mean, a church, absent vision and mission, belief and engagement, uh, becomes morally bankrupt. Um, or spiritually bankrupt is maybe a better term for it. No fruit is produced. No fruit is produced. No production occurs. Because we have to be attached to divine. Notice in John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. You know, that sums it up in a nutshell, doesn't it? It's not about personality. It's not about who's um, in charge. It's not about who is the pastor. Jesus Christ said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Not the pastor. (laughs) Not some organization. God takes away those that do not bear fruit. I mean, it's just the way it works. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken you. Abide in me and I in you. I mean, there's an interconnection between the vine or the trunk of the tree, to use a different analogy, and the branches that then branch out all the way to the leaves and the twigs where the actual production occurs and the fruit is produced. Jesus Christ is the vine that makes it all work. The Holy Holy Spirit the Bible tells us, proceeds from the Father through Jesus Christ to us. And it flows, Jesus Christ promised, if we have authentic belief, like rivers, plural, out of your heart to enable you to do things that are not possible. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. So if you look at the plant, the vine analogy here that is rooted in the rich values of the Bible in the soil. With Jesus Christ being the vine, the the stem, the stalk that comes up out of the ground. You know, we need to be attached to that in order for authentic belief to work. Because unless we are attached to that vine, the, 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 the Holy Spirit that the Bible tells us proceeds from the Father through Jesus Christ to us to unleash the power that we want to capture. It doesn't work. Fruit cannot be produced without 
You know, if you, if you start studying trees and plants and you know, there's an entire vascular system that is within the plant and the, the, the sap goes up through the plant all the way out to the leaf. And then there's a process of photosynthesis that takes place that actually creates a, a pump that causes this circulatory system to occur so that the twigs out there at the very end can produce fruit, which I found to be an extraordinarily helpful analogy in an organization, uh, organizational sense. And I like to ask the question, do twigs matter? And, you know, I, I think the implication is, nah, they're just twigs. Until you start thinking about it, and we think about it in a church context, in a church context, it is upon the twigs where the fruit is produced. You know, you can, you can transpose that uh, into a church or an organization. And clearly any organizational structure requires a lot of support and stability and structure in order for it to work. I mean, there have been a lot of management fads over the past decades um, trying to counteract some of the toxic situations that occur in organizations that are based on a, on a greedy model. And, you know, you have self-managed teams. If you want to see something that's really unproductive, find yourself a self-managed team. Nothing gets done except having meetings so that we can schedule another meeting, so that at the next meeting you schedule yet another meeting, because there is nobody that wants to make a decision. So we, we see here the the necessity of having an organizational structure in which support and nutrients pulled out of the soil as Jesus Christ analyzed uh, says here in John chapter 15 drawing on the the values of scripture and pushing it out to the twigs so that fruit can be produced in this case a vine you know the grapes hang on the twigs of the vine that is where the activity and the life is. And that's why it is a whole church effort. You know, when I walked through those doors 20-some years ago, I mean, I needed the support <clears throat> of the pastor, the instruction of the pastor. But, you know, beyond that, I needed the concern and love and care of the quote-unquote twigs attached to the branches of that vine. And then it worked. Because there is where I learned all about how to keep the Sabbath. And all about how to tithe. And all about how to de leaven. And all about a hundred other things about which I had no idea. All about actual love and concern and you know, like I said, all about the hundred other things I had no idea. Because that's where the life was. And now you say, okay, well, what if someone told you something that was wrong? They did. I was told some pretty interesting stuff over the years. You know what? It doesn't matter. Because if you're attached to divine, it will self-correct at some point. You know, the fact that I walked down in between the two um, sets of, I'm calling bleachers, and met Frank Preby, who some of you will, will remember, and he said, John, I want to tell you something. In this church, you get to pay three tithes. And I'm a young man. I have two kids, another one on the way. Three tithes. I had just learned about tithe number one. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. I'm going to go broke. So yeah, I went to a more reliable source who explained to me what that actually meant, which was something quite different. So 
what, what should we have done? Corral this particular individual? I'm sure that there was an animated discussion between him and the pastor after I inquired about um, the validity of this church having collecting 30% of my money. But my point is simply that as in the analogy of the, the vine, those, those, those things are not, the fact that those things happen in, in an organization and in a church is not an excuse for us to not engage the entire church because far more will get done. You know, I said I go back to John chapter 7, 37 every day. And I get up and I do and I fail every day. The only bigger failure would be to not go there every day and to not do every day. Because when we engage in authentic belief, um, those mistakes that are made, as the proverb says, the righteous man will fall seven times and get up. The mistakes will self-correct. But the organization and you are alive. So let's read the guiding principles that are on this particular document. It states, We believe that our Father has given us the opportunity to build a relationship with Him, with Jesus Christ, with one another, and with all mankind. We believe the immutable Word of God shows us how to build those loving relationships and become more like Jesus Christ. We believe. We profess. We teach, we say. That's the easy part. Let's go over to the reference scripture in John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may... All be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I mean, that is a mouthful. That is a prayer. That is a request by Jesus Christ on our behalf from none other than the creator of the universe. Continuing in verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. That's what we profess. That is the vision. That is the promise and request of Jesus Christ of what we are to become. And when we have authentic vision, the fact that it doesn't, that the fact that in reality it may not yet exist in its fullness should not deter us from moving forward the message. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That's the profession. That's what we believe. But here's my point. It only becomes authentic when we go to the next level and do what is stated here in the therefore. Because of all those compelling reasons that are articulated in the greater mission of bringing many sons to glory, There's a therefore. Therefore, we will strive to live by every word of God, led by His Holy Spirit in humility, enabling those relationships to grow and flourish. As long as we just believe, none, nothing happens. Nothing happens. It is a mere platitude. Actually, 
it is a exemplification of ingratitude when we believe and profess and teach and do not become engaged. Therefore, we will strive to live by every word of God led by his Holy Spirit in humility enabling these relationships to grow and flourish. Now, what does that look like when the rubber meets the road? I'm not going to give you my example because any example that I would give you would be flawed. Let's go look at how Jesus Christ exercised the therefore. Matthew chapter 4. You know, the one thing about Satan the devil is he's not bashful. You know, that's, that is a character trait that he has carried from the time of Job and into the New Testament and I'm sure that he still carries that trait. You know, remember in Job, you know, the sons of God were gathered before him and um, Satan presented himself and, you know, he wasn't bashful about accusing Job before God. And he wasn't bashful about coming to tempt Jesus Christ. And we see this here in Matthew chapter 4. You know, Jesus Christ had this greater vision. Here we see how he applied it. Notice in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted day, 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry, now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, and Jesus Christ could have responded and said, Of course, what do you mean, if I am the Son of God? If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, quote, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how Jesus Christ set an example of how to live by every word. When he was tempted and challenged, he quoted scripture. He did not comply. And of course, then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angel charge concerning you. Oh, so Satan's a quick learner. Jesus Christ quoted scripture, so he quoted scripture back. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Jesus Christ knew the vision. He embodied the Son of God. It was depending on him. But knowing that vision and believing in it required a therefore of actually living by the words himself. If we want to unleash, if we want to capture the power of authentic vision, we have to go beyond profession and actually become engaged. Second, point here. We believe God has a plan of salvation for every individual who will yield to him and his son Jesus Christ. That plan includes the calling and perfecting of those 
who are converted now as well as those to be converted in the ages to come. That is a, that is a powerful, all, all encompassing statement. It is a wonderful thing to believe and to profess and to teach. But it will get us nowhere unless we go beyond belief, beyond platitudes to authentic belief that then, and that, that, you know, we, we, when, when you really believe something, you can't help but act. You know? That's, that's the dynamic. You know, we, we do, we act on what we believe. Oh, it might be different from what we profess to believe. I mean, there are many people that profess to follow Jesus Christ and then behave in a manner that makes that impossible. I mean, if you follow Jesus Christ, you would, I think it is logical, be acting and doing as he did. We do what we actually believe, not what we profess. So even the absence of action on this wonderful platitude is a, therefore, a demonstration of our lack of belief in what we profess to believe. There's always a therefore. It's just the question of whether or not we are acting upon our profession or acting and following something other than that, which is a pretty damning situation because it not only makes us unbelievers, it worse, it makes us liars and hypocrites. Let's look at the therefore. Therefore, it is the duty of the church to proclaim a message of hope and a call to repentance to teach all things Christ has commanded and to prepare members of the body of Christ to teach, lead, and serve under him now and in the future. You see, any authentic vision, and I track back to the silly example that I gave you about me as a five-year-old, any authentic vision requires immediate action. In my case, soaking walnuts in a tin can. If I had not done that, all of them would have died. (laughs) I probably didn't soak them well enough. You see, in order for vision to be authentic and belief to be authentic, it requires action right away. Hence the statement, now, so that we may participate in the future would be another way of stating it. We see that over in Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 28. I mean it is the vision it is the mission of the church that is so um articulately emblazoned upon the seal that is in front of the podium preach the gospel prepare a people. I mean it's succinct it it encapsulates what we profess to do. That is our duty. It requires engagement right now. Verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Christ is speaking to a motley group of disciples, all of which had just deserted him weeks earlier. (laughs) And he he entrusted them, them, those twelve, with that commission to go into all the world. You know, from a human perspective, you could question his sanity. I put that in quotes. You know, all of them fled except Peter, and and those and and the one that stayed when the hour of trial was there denied him three times. I mean that should give us hope. And of course, when we look at what occurred, I mean, go to the whole world, twelve of you on foot. 
Is that doable? No. But neither is it possible for rivers of waters to come from a singular heart. There is another power that is unleashed when belief is authentic. And those 12 apostles, the the 120, sandal-clad individuals in Palestine, in an out-of-the-way protectorate of the, the great Roman Empire, literally, arguably, accomplish what is stated here. Jesus Christ, a carpenter, who, from all we know, never ventured more than a couple hundred miles from his home uh, in Nazareth, is the most widely, is arguably the most widely recognized name in the world today, even if it is often misunderstood and perhaps not accurately portrayed. The message was carried to all the world. We, in the latter times, have been tasked with that same task. We're a lot more than 12 people, but we're a small amount. But to the extent that we do our duty, God will bless us, and he has. I mean, the most notable thing I, thing I think in this regard is the fact that the UCG.org website ranks among the top 15 um websites and traffic for Christian denominations. And that's a remarkable achievement. But it will accomplish nothing if the entire church is not fully engaged to support and to bear fruit and to actually live the message that we profess to believe. We're all about marriage, right? We're all about all these different things. We have the truth. We are not We are not, as an organization or in the Church of God community in a larger sense, destroyed for lack of knowledge. I would argue that we probably have the most cohesive, logical, complete theological framework of any church denomination since the first century. Of course, there are a lot of people that would dispute that, but okay, um, dispute it. My point is that we're not destroyed for lack of knowledge. We are only destroyed if we only believe and do not act on the therefore. Continuing. The next we believe is, we believe. Let's see, which one? Where am I at? Let me see here. We believe that every individual of every race and nationality and gender will in in God's time have the opportunity to hear the testimony of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection and the good news of the kingdom of God. We believe that the gospel explicitly provides every individual an opportunity when called for membership in the family of God according to his will, citing Acts chapter 10. Verse 34 through 35. And that is a remarkable truth. That God has a plan that was set in motion before the creation of the world that leaves no one behind. And because of that, we state that therefore in order to maximize the effectiveness of the gospel message, we endeavor to reach all people in a way that they can understand with a balanced mix of doctrine, prophecy, and Christian living, recognizing that any lasting fruit is produced by the power of the Holy Spirit. It requires action. It requires us to get behind the gospel message, both in the preaching and perhaps, I mean, 
We're already in the top 15 on the websites. We have a television program. Okay, there, there is a, there is a lot being done. The, the question is the fruit being produced, and I think rightly the emphasis being on it being a whole church effort, is for us to become engaged individually in living it. And I would submit to you, you should do it because it is the best way to live. You see, that's the benefit of becoming engaged in this vision is because it's the best way to live. You know, I deal with people all the time in all different areas and stuff in life. And, uh, you know, when, when you've got over a 100 employees and, uh, you know, you learn a, a lot about people. And people have big challenges. And in some cases, they're no fault of their own because they've inherited generational issues that they now have the burden of carrying out because previous generations lived in a manner inconsistent with what the Bible teaches. So we have a responsibility to preach the gospel in that we care enough to reach out and help if help is wanted. That's the other side of it. We believe that as we near the end of the age, humanity is in urgent need of the gospel message in advance of the events surrounding Christ's return. We believe Jesus Christ commissioned his church to declare what is to come to warn of the consequence of sin, to preach repentance and proclaim the hope of eternal salvation. To warn, to preach, to teach, and to proclaim the hope. You know, again, it is a an entire package where one should not be done to the exclusion of the other, where on the one hand of the spectrum... We teach grace and eternal life to the exclusion of the responsibility to actually live in accordance with God's principles and laws. Or, on the other hand, where you preach a warning message to the exclusion of the reason why a warning is necessary, and that is so that you repent, like Nineveh did, in order to be able to be a part of and receive eternal life and grace in the future. We already read Matthew chapter 28. Let's go to Mark chapter, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. I mean, this is a scripture that is a central prophecy of what the church is required to do or will do. <clears throat> Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. It's not a question of whether it's going to be done. It's only a question to what extent we participate in it whether that be public proclamation or by our individual life example. Life example is um, always more powerful. Ezekiel chapter 33. Let's look at the warning. Ezekiel 33. Verse 1, And again the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land and the people of the land take a man from their territory to make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land and if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. 
So even in this Ezekiel um, Watchman chapter, we notice that the purpose of the warning is to save lives. So as we engage in the therefore and give a warning, it needs to be done in a manner in which people will take notice and heed. Now, not everybody will, but that's the objective. That's the objective. Verse 6, But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. That is the other side of the coin. If we just profess and don't become engaged, you know, we, if we believe that the gospel of the kingdom of God must be preached in all the world and then the end will come, if we believe that, we will do that. We always do what we believe. What we do may be different from what we profess to believe, but it is an actual manifestation of what we do believe. And as we see here, there are dire consequences if we don't do our duty. Finally here, because of all of this, Therefore, we take seriously the church's responsibility to boldly preach the gospel as a witness to this world with zeal and a sense of urgency. It requires, as Ephesians so neatly articulates, the entire body, led by the Holy Spirit, joined and knit together by what every member supplies with all doing their share and growing in love to fulfill God's great purpose for humanity to bring many children to glory. Whether it is about a warning message or about how we interact with our neighbors or with how we publish things, it all circles back and attaches to authentic vision. And if we couple that with authentic belief, we, the church, and you, the membership, will be empowered by the very promise of Jesus Christ to do what is not possible. And that is to carry this vision to the entire world.